The International Association for Near-Death Studies presents NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. Welcome to NDE Radio, brought to you by IONS, the International Association for Near-Death Studies. I'm your host, Lee Whitting. Our return guest today is Trisha Barker, who we first interviewed on this show last November. Following a terrible car accident, Trisha experienced a profound near-death experience during her senior year of college. This experience guided her to a career in teaching, and as a result, she has taught overseas in public and private schools and at the college level. Her near-death experience story has been featured on I Survived, Beyond and Back, and was covered by National Geographic. We first interviewed Trisha on our November 5th, 2018 show, and you can hear the description of her NDE by going to our past shows button. Trisha's memoir, Angels in the OR, What Dying Taught Me About Healing, Survival, and Transformation, has just been published and is available as an e-book and on Audible as well. This book tells a story of her near-death experience, uh, teaching mission, and eventual triumph over traumas in her past. It also focuses on the importance of her of being of service to the world. Trisha teaches English at a community college in Fort Worth and interviews near-death experiencers, researchers, and healers on her YouTube channel. Trisha's poetry and essays have been published in several publications, including the Binnacle, the Patterson Literary Review, and the Midwest Quarterly. Trisha, welcome back to NDE Radio, and congratulations on your amazing book, Angels in the OR. Oh, thank you, Lee. It's so great to be back. I love your show. Oh, uh, well, I love your book. And what struck me about the book was how well you integrated the hardships of some of your family and social life growing up with the, with the lessons of your NDE. It's, it's, um, almost as if the light gifted you a magic mirror and ongoing understanding of your history as if your, um, life review in heaven takes place with even more weight in the book than it did in the NDE. Yeah, you know, the life review is such an important part of a near-death experience. I mean, I think that's what makes most of us come back and become better people, if that makes sense, <laughs> because <laughs> because we look deeply into our part in situations and situations and then how we can transform difficult situations with love and that was the essential message. Yes, I survived child abuse, and yes, I went through a lot, but that doesn't give me um, an out. You know, I have to do my own healing work, and I have to show the way to help others heal. Mm-hmm. You know, there's people joke, you know, like the the big joke with uh, sitting on a legal stand or, you know, in a law, in a court of law is someone is like, well, he had such a hard childhood or she had such a hard childhood. Give him an out. No, it's it's not an out. (laughs) Do we get to make, (laughs) do we get to make those excuses? Are we our own lawyer in in the life review? (laughs) Not necessarily. You know, God didn't make me live through any pain that others caused me, but I, I was accountable for how I acted and what I did to other people. And I think you review that very well in in the book, not as part of the life review, but just by doing a life review. And it's it's amazing how I think the NDE has colored your understanding of your life, um, past and present. Anyway, if we had hours (laughs) to talk, I'd ask lots of questions about the events (laughs) in your life. (laughs) But uh, since it's a show about NDEs, uh, I'd like to cover some of the questions that we didn't get to in our in our first show. Yeah, uh, go ahead. Okay. You write uh, that you were met by giant angels, androgynous, more light than solid, and enhanced reality. Were they yours personally, do you think, or are they there to help doc- guide other doctors through other operations in the OR? You know, it makes sense to me that we each have our own angels, and I have had these visions, and I write about it in one section of the book where I don't don't visually see angels now, uh, but I did one moment, and I saw that everybody had a few walking beside them and just, you know, being there in spirit. So I think those were my guardian angels, or at least angels who are participating in healing during surgery. And 
I think we can call on them far more frequently, these messengers of God, than we realize. And and that can be a way to help us with smaller problems. I mean, certainly, it's always good to give big issues and, and uh, give things to God. But I think some part of our soul maybe might open up to the idea of angels helping us find parking spaces or you know small things. <laughs> <laughs> People do rely heavily on angels for parking spaces when they're living in cities. <laughs> right? We don't have that problem in rural Maine at all. We save our angels for, for better reasons. You said the angels <laughs> were, <laughs> were super intelligent, that they streamed light knowledge from their eyes, uh, not in words, but in complete thought units. And, you know, it sounded, to put it in our terms, like... Um, like computers going from digital to quantum. Uh, and I thought, <laughs> I, w I wonder if we have a possibility of evolving into a, into a, a gift like that ourselves. What do, you th what do you think? I hope so. Maybe text messaging is the first uh, step <laughs> in that. <laughs> I've, I've, wondered, <laughs> I've wondered about that because we send our instant thoughts to one another. And if you're somewhat intuitive, sometimes you can pick up on, the moment when someone's thinking about you and maybe we're evolving to this ability where we can transfer a lot of information and maybe at the very least we're opening up to trusting our intuition more and knowing it as a true reality that we're becoming more energetically sensitive and as part of survival but as part of uh, just a spiritual gift so I'd like to think so I, I think that at the very least, do these experiences open the minds of people? And once your mind is open, then that realm of possibility opens up things like that. Mm. I hadn't thought of texting. That's a, that's a good analogy. Uh, the details of your NDE, like uh, like many others, uh, like many other people I've talked to about about NDEs, was intensely personal. Uh, insofar as it was your grandfather Clyde, as a young man who came in his blue pickup truck across a supernatural field of green, green grass to give you as a little girl, as you saw yourself, you said, I think between the ages of five and seven at that moment, a ride in his truck toward the light. And uh, I, I, it crossed my mind, do you think NDEs are personally designed for each experiencer or is it your mind that's overlaying your own uh, imagination as to the details of what's happening? What I think, and this is in two part, I think that God meets us where we need to be met at that moment to learn the lessons that we need to learn. But I do think we're participating in this field of creation to some degree. You know, that idea of like when my spirit body left the room where my body was on the operating table, I decided to do that. And I decided to go through the wall quickly. And when I entered heaven, I also decided to become, as God said, like a little child. And so since we get to choose our spirit form, if I was older, maybe I would have chosen my 20s or 30s, but I was already 22. So I thought, all right, then I'll be like a little child. And I entered heaven as a child because I had great faith as a child. I was agnostic from 13 to 22. And so there was something about entering heaven with that great faith that resonated with my soul, if that makes sense. And then Jeffrey Long, Dr. Jeffrey Long, he talks about, and I find this fascinating, no one ever meets someone who isn't dead in heaven. So in a way, that's a verifiable moment that we all meet ancestors who have passed on and people have met people who they didn't know they had died you know, someone in elementary school or a distant relative who's already there, and then they later find after their NDE that that person did indeed die. That's that's interesting. Uh, I have talked to people who said, what are you doing here? You're not dead. And it turns out when they go back, they find that the person had just died. Um, yeah. It was tr true also for a, for a person's pet that turned up <laughs> in oh. one uh, – <laughs> I know, and, and one of the stories that I heard was that, you know, why is my dog here? Well, as it turned out. The overlay, though, of how people get, trans get transported toward the light or into the light um, can be so different and so personal that it just seems like maybe we create a uh, a comfortable mode of transportation 
as we're going into something that's pretty awesome um, and overwhelming if if you don't feel worthy of of the love you're feeling yeah that that does make sense that on some level it's personal, but what there are some common themes that do resonate, and you've probably seen them as well that overwhelming love is overwhelming love, like no one ever. I would think that they wouldn't have had a near-death experience if they felt, like, alone in the light or afraid of the light. Like, it's the most beautiful love ever imaginable. So, of course, you're going to open up to God's great love. I mean, I think most people who see the light or feel the light in a near-death experience to some degree are drawn to it. You know, we're, our souls are like moths to that flame. Yes, take me to God. <laughs> I have talked to people who felt that uh, as they were going into the light that they were losing themselves in a way that scared them, mm. that they were they felt like they were going to be so consumed by that love that they would lose themselves and they and they voluntarily pulled back. But that's uh, I think that's more unusual than usual. I've got another question yeah. for you. <laughs> <laughs> You you mentioned in your book you had tripped on LSD a few times. Right. How would you, <laughs> and how would you Okay. All, all those uh, uh, ecstasy? Did you ever? Yes. Yes. Uh, okay. Well, uh, given your drug of choice, how would you compare tripping and walking through a field, for example, uh, with a, with how would you compare that to the green grass you saw in heaven? Oh, it's not even comparable. You know, a dream or an acid trip is, to me, not comparable. And I was, I experimented with drugs in college and, and I took several trips. And although those were funny at times and interesting, the, I'm not sure that I was really learning anything deep from those moments, uh, to be honest, and maybe that was the setting, you know, a college town and hanging out with friends uh, mm. where I had those experiences. But, but yeah, the near-death experience felt like the well, first time seemed completely not rele- relevant in that space. I felt like many things were happening at once, and that alone is mind-blowing. And then I felt as if in the beginning stages of my near-death experience, maybe some people would compare this to an acid trip. There was a another reality imposed on this one. So, you know, that, but it was so much clearer, so much brighter, and it seemed like, oh, this is the real reality. I think when when uh, dropping acid, you you kind of know, like, this is your real reality, but there's like, oh, suddenly there's flowers behind this building or fire behind this building or Oh, my friend morphed into Jimi Hendrix, you know, whatever <laughs> the case <laughs> might be. Um, you know, it, you realize that uh, that you're playing with reality with your mind, um, you know, when hallucinating. But but in the near death experience, I knew that this new reality was the real reality. Mm-hmm. At least for the, my spirit, because I was dead. You know. <laughs> yes. Yes. Of course. There's a, I think there's a generational difference. Uh, earlier, uh, when when people were using um, uh, LSD for, I think when it was first discovered, really, and you had books like Be Here Now being written, and and uh, uh, Esalen Institute uh, ex- using it for meditational and, and experiential reasons, spiritual reasons, fundamentally, that um, it it perhaps got some of these drugs got more trivialized by students later on who just wanted to have a good time at the root of uh, drug experience. though, I think people are kids, especially are looking for some kind of spiritual truth, at least when they first start out on this, on this stuff, uh, oh, yeah. because they have no, a lot of them now have no spiritual backgrounds or church membership or anything they can relate to uh, beyond this you know this ordinary world, and so they're looking for something new and 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 different. Yeah, I hoped. I think you know when I first took drugs in college that I might open up because to a spiritual reality or to a deeper knowledge. Because I, I took philosophy classes and I was an English major and I was curious on some level, but but yeah, it didn't. I guess open me up to any of that because of like you said the scene and you know how it was was used, but. 
But, you know, after the near-death experience, I'll be honest, I wasn't interested in drugs at all. You know, I knew that what I'd experienced was so profound and so intense and so beautiful that I was only interested in meditation and what could happen through that. And and certainly, I think uh, I come back without the after effects you know, of, a, yes. of a trip. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no headaches. My body feels good after a good meditation. <laughs> That, that's absolutely true. You had a warning dream the night before your accident with your um, one or both parents screaming to you to watch out. Do you think it would have been possible to change your future by heeding that warning? Or do you think God intended your NDE or or maybe both? You know, <laughs> I, I, I ponder that a lot because I did wake up tired because of those dreams and I wonder if those dreams caused the near-death experience because I was so tired I might have fallen asleep at the wheel, you know, for a split second. And uh-huh. and that uh, that moment I just don't understand completely. Maybe I'll have to wait till I'm back there again. But what I think it was beginning to show me is that time is um, it's out of sync. And after the near-death experience, I had lots of psychic flashes and moments. So this was a premonition moment. And then later, you know, there were moments after the near-death experience where I would know what was going to happen in the future. So I think it showed me two things that, you know, the bond between parents and kids is very strong. It's spiritual and biological and, and, you know, there's that intense bond. And I'm sure they feel it on a profound level when their child is in danger or, or might die. And so that, that just showed me that that bond exists. You mentioned that veridical experience of uh, watching Jim get a Snickers bar when you were out of your body. Evidence like that is what makes these things so real because, uh, I mean, to the to the people who haven't had them, they're very real to people who have. Did that persuade your family? I mean, in, in talking to them, was this a bit of evidence that really pushed them into believing what, what happened to you was real? It did initially. I think everyone was consumed with the physical elements of what happened. You know, if she's in a body cast, oh, let's, you know, make sure she can walk. And, you know, that was their main concern. But as I talked more with my mom, I think when I first told her that story and she verified that at the moment when when I had indeed died, uh, she and my father were praying in the waiting room, and my stepdad came back in with that candy bar, made a joke. He's kind of a funny guy and offered them some of the candy bar, and she remembered thinking, okay, you know, everything's going to be okay. And that moment did convince her a small, tiny bit, but she's extremely religious, my mother and her minister, believe that near-death experiences are of the devil if they don't feature a religious figure, Jesus, immediately. And, you know, my experience just featured the light, and I think most experiences don't feature a religious figure. Many of them do, but but most don't. And and so she tried to convince me that my experience was not of God. And I, you know, I had to tell her, I was like, Mom, the soul knows God when it meets God. And I know that I met God. And I know that I'm a changed person. And you'll just have to look at, at that and, and just um, have faith in that. But, but she really didn't. And so I think that moment didn't mean much to her other than, I had an out-of-body experience, but the rest of it might have been from the devil in her mind. So she does believe that there's an an incarnate being of evil in the world and influencing the world. Yeah, yeah. And so that was really disappointing, you know, and I argued with her for a while. But eventually, in order to get along with my mom, we stayed away from religion and politics and mainly talked about food because that's where we met. (laughs) (laughs) Does her minister or does her church um, see the importance of emphasizing love as as the basis of being? Oh, no. I went to their church one time, and it was horrifying. I mean, like, it's all based on fear. You know, there are churches in Texas that tell people to go bury guns in their backyard for the end of times and to stockpile food and 
and don't send your kids to college because they become secularized and you know, just some mm. bad advice in general. <laughs> yeah, you know yeah. that, and it's just very, very fear based. And that was that was my whole point after the near death experiences. I was like, take me to institutions that focus on love and service to the community and doing good in this world, not fear. Because if I walk into that energy of fear and judgment and hate. And, you know, let's hate this group of people. That's not what I learned in the presence of God. I learned to come back here with a mission to help people be their best self and to really inspire them to do good in the world. Because I got so much joy spreading love and and, uh, making, you know, other people's lives better. I would think other people could access more joy by doing the same. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Well, that leads right into my next question, <laughs> uh, because you, you write over and over that love is all that matters intrinsically, basically. So how do we confront and change evil, and cruelty, and corruption, and, and greed in this world if the cruel and the abusive victimizers don't respond to love? You know, I'm going to quote a um Another near-death experiencer who I, I found her uh, message to be so beautiful, but Ingrid Honkala said, and she created this metaphor in a speech in Dallas where she said, imagine that you had a huge house and it was extremely messy, like every part of it was messy. If you thought about cleaning up the whole thing, you'd be overwhelmed. But if you just took a counter that day and you said, you know what, I'm going to clean off this counter and I'm going to make it spotless, then you would feel better. And that's the way I look about uh, issues in this world. You know, we pick something, you know, we pick an organization, we pick, you know, a business sector, if if that's where we have a gift, we pick schools, if that's where we have a gift. And obviously, you know, that's where my gift has been. And we do as much as we can to transform that and to educate others about how to transform that area. But yeah, we can't transform the whole thing, but we can choose love in the face of tragedy. So, you know, in the face of school shootings and mass shootings, I know that many energy workers and and people descend onto those locations, and we don't hear about it in the news, to help others relieve, relieve their trauma, to begin the healing process. And I think that's fabulous, and we need to focus more on that. You know, how do we bring love to areas that have endured tragedy? Do you think it's our responsibility to um, save the earth, the planet, the environment, or, or are we just visiting here, sort of dipping our toe in uh, to to learn a life lesson of some sort that we can take back to um, heaven? Well, one of my messages in the near-death experience was remind them to go to nature. And I think that that is multifaceted. There's healing that happens in nature when we just breathe a little bit more, look at a beautiful sky, look at a beautiful flower. Somehow our minds get righted a little bit easier in nature and the energy of nature helps us reset. But perhaps if we are reminded to go to nature more often as a culture, then we'll start remembering not to harm nature, because if nature provides us with that much healing and that much beauty, then why not treat it better? And if nature indeed can even reverse illnesses and help with mental illness and help in so many different ways, then why not treat it as the sacred thing that it is? Mm. Well, we certainly haven't been doing that. I mean, uh... The, the earth is in crisis right now, um, environmentally, uh, species are going extinct by the, by the million and, and, um, uh, so there may be just a limited amount of time to, uh, to save this part of creation. Do you think that heaven also is a part of creation? Angels were created, humans were created. Um, what, uh, what happens at the end of creation? Just to throw a simple question at you. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I was like, wow, that's not challenging at all. Thanks, Lee. (laughs) I had a near-death experience, but when I came back, I was 
clearly aware of my limited mind. It was like, and I think every every near death experience kind of feels that like you feel connected to this amazing expanse of intelligence and energy, and then you get shoved back into your own mind and brain, and you're like, oh no, <laughs> if only I had the answers from out there. So, yeah, creation. I think uh, I I hope that. I, I realize that there's a lot of people who believe that we will just destroy this planet. And it's so sad to see young people who are 15, 16, totally hopeless because, you know, they might be incredibly intelligent, but they're like, what's the point of even graduating high school? Probably, you know, like if you span it out, I might not have more of a lifespan than 50. I mean, that's what they're looking at and what some teenagers believe. And I, I try to remind them that every bit of good that you do might start reversing things, you know, that it's still worth it, that still pouring love into this place is what you take with you, that sitting back and and not trying is um, is not going to make you feel good at the end of your life. It's really not that, you know, if love is all that matters, just pour love into this place and you know, we've seen miraculous things. Anita Morjani's near-death experience is amazing how the angels completely reversed her cancer. So who says that we can't reverse some of the horrible things that are happening to the planet with uh, enough faith and enough work? That's why God intended you to be a teacher. That, that's excellent. Uh, you say in your book uh, you could feel the prayers from your family, but only the ones that contained love were effective. That that prayers without love are meaningless. Why don't you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah. So love is like that elixir that that makes everything so much more beautiful and so much more meaningful. And, you know, if you're just doing something for lip service and you don't really need it, then it, it doesn't have as much power or as much juice, you know, if you're like, mm. oh, I really hope that works out. And I, you might even say that the same thing, can be true for manifestation or for anything that we're working on. If you connect with love, then you're going to have so much more energy to help. And it seemed as if prayers that were connected to greater energy uh, just came through a lot easier. It was easier to read them or feel them. You know, that energy of love is more powerful than we, we might know. Mm-hmm. And, and to follow up on that, you say in your epilogue that uh, a relationship is not a substitute for God and that uh, nothing matters more than knowing that we are loved by God. So talk about that a yeah. little bit, too. Yeah. Well, you know, I thought of all the people who are widowed or divorced or just haven't felt the right person, found the right person. And, you know, it's beautiful to love. You know, it's beautiful to love your kids. It's beautiful to be in a loving relationship or marriage. You know, that's a great way to use God's love to enhance another person's life and make that that an experience that's beautiful for them. But I think many near-death experiencers do not feel alone after that experience with God. You know, I, I can be walking on the river by myself, but I feel my angels and I feel God working in my life and wanting to be there. And I just don't want anyone to ever feel alone, even if they are alone, if that makes sense. Mm. When God had you look down at the river and the lights that were along the side of the river that were individuals, did, did was there a connection between those lights or were they alone? Were they isolated from one another? Oh, that's an interesting, really interesting question. I I felt that the more of them that were turned on, the better the community was or the better that that path was, that, you know, the more people who were walking in the light of God, then it it created more light. So you might say sinners that have a lot of focus on spirituality or um, maybe it even spreads from person to person, you know, that that um, that's a beautiful thought. Uh, there did seem to be the shadows that that covered other souls that seemed to be fear and that cut them off from everyone. And that mm-hmm. that kind of goes back to that early question about my mother and her her church and her religion. Yeah, that they're very cut off from the rest of the world, the community, because of fear. And that's sad. 
you know, that, that we, the light connects us to other people, you know, light extends, but fear is constricting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Tricia, we're just about out of time for today. Uh, congratulations once again on the book. Uh, I hope people go out and, uh, I, I got the audible copy and I thought, I thought she did a very good job of reading it, but, um, oh, yeah. sometimes, sometimes a it. book, a book in your hand is even better because you can go back and, and look up things again easily. Uh, yeah. tell the audience how you can find your book and also your YouTube channel. Yes. So, uh, Angels in the OR, you can find it at Barnes and Noble and Amazon, Audible, many different locations. And then if you check out my YouTube channel, you'll also see that I have a near death experience summit with Dr. Moody, Dr. Long, Dr. Eben Alexander, Nancy Ryans, Leslie Lupo. So many near death experiencers are speaking at this online summit because, uh, I know that people can't, um, you know, they can't always travel to go hear speakers, and it's a great way to to hear all these speakers talk. So I love all my connections on YouTube. Oh, terrific. Thank you again, Trisha Barker, for telling us your fascinating story. If listeners would like to uh, hear this show again or any of our past shows, just go to our website at nderadio.org and hit the Past Shows button. And for information about IANS, go to their website at iands.org. And be with us again next Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern, for more NDE Radio. This is your host, Lee Whitting, saying thanks for listening.